who sets the pace for the company. Uh, many times, uh, well, most people will tell you, or at least uh, certainly macro sociologists will tell you that the company's culture or the organization's culture itself, uh, obviously when you're talking about businesses, they all share similar things of uh, adherence to certain capitalistic principles, certain ideas of profit, certain ideas of codes of professionalism, how you should talk or dress or behave or what types of subjects are appropriate to bring up at work and what ones aren't. Uh, some companies have uh, rules against dating co-workers, others are, it's not so clear. Some have stated rules about, and make sure everybody gets the attendance sheet please. Uh, and some people have, and, and some companies have stated rules about people dating or whatever, uh, but they don't enforce these things, or have dress codes and they don't enforce these things. I, I, almost every organization I've ever worked for does not adhere to their own codes. And one of the problems is that you leave yourself vulnerable to legal action by your employees. Okay, you're going to fire somebody because they're dating a coworker, but you didn't fire the boss who was dating a secretary. You're going to have a problem. You're going to get sued. Okay, so maybe it's a instructional for those of you who are interested in starting a business. If you write rules down, you'd better follow them. Seriously, I mean, I'll tell you right now, it's one of the reasons why, uh, particularly you, your age group, but many people don't like the police and don't trust the police. Do the police always follow their own rules? Do they read you the Miranda rights? Do, do they wait for a search warrant to come into your house? And on top of that, the speed limit's 55 miles an hour. They don't even enforce that. All right? So, one of the issues, and, and again, each or every organization, no matter if it's economic or governmental or educational or a family organization, has some form of culture. Now, again, back to who sets culture, many times, obviously, some of the larger elements of culture are set by the formal policies that are decided upon either by the board of directors, if it's a big company, or by the owners of the company, if it's a small one, like a family restaurant or something like that. Um, but within that framework of organizational culture, the individuals at the lower level also feed up into the culture, either by accepting and, legit and giving legitimacy to the policies, right, and time bind to some extent, or by violating them and, and the, the other managers allowing them to violate these things. Uh, one of the issues here is, is at a company like Amerco, the CEO cannot be around all the time. Uh, so one of the big issues is, uh, on the factory floor, how much of the CEO and the board of directors' ideas about how things should be done are actually put into force? And they're usually not. It's usually, if the CEO is going to come down to the factory floor, there's usually this type of conversation. Uh-oh, we better read up on the policy and make sure everything's right. And some people say, you know what, it's, it's usually the exception to the rule that, that people don't follow the company policy. And, and, and other people would suggest... Um, it's an exception to the rule that, uh, it, it, that in reality most people in most organizations don't come anywhere near close to following the stated rules of the company. Okay, but when you let, but let's go back to the, so let's go back to this idea of professionalism. Um, let's because I'm going to show you a piece from Google here about how different their corporate culture is. Let's take a company that. Very few people think is innovative or creative or, or would be a, necessarily a fun place to work for. Let's take, sorry, IBM. Let's take IBM, which has been around for almost 100 years. It's, it stands for International Business Machines. They're one of the first ones who started building big mainframe computers and servers, and they still do all this kind of stuff. They have not, however, figured out how to make money making software or a whole bunch of other stuff. And frankly, they don't even make PCs anymore. It's what they used to. What impression do you get about how you would have to dress and behave, and, and would it be a friendly human environment where you could bring your dogs and have casual Friday or not? Somebody give me an idea of what you think the professional standards are like at, at, at IBM. Sure. Yeah, and probably a three-piece suit potentially. Uh, you better have your hair cut, and I, I assure you, you're not going to have facial hair like Brad Pitt looks like sometimes, or he looks like he just woke up out of a cardboard box, and he might have been. Anyway. <clears throat> wife looks like the cardboard box. Anyway, um, so you have this element that you need to be clean cut, not only for your other workers, but if, especially if you're in a customer-oriented business like IBM. Um, and again, you know, if you're a McDonald's employee, you wear a uniform, right? And it's really used, it's usually made out of disgusting polyester uh, that never fits right, um, it, it, and, and a stupid hat. 
which does nothing to stop hair from falling in your food. I just thought I'd tell you that. Or other things. God knows. What? Skin cells and other things like that. Um, but as, uh, what about the behavior at IBM? Would you be able to just banter or make jokes about your boss and have him just laugh it off? Do you think they encourage a lot of creativity among their low-level employees? What do you think they encourage when it comes to the rules? Conformity. You better follow the rules or else, right? Remember, we talked a little bit about the power structure that companies have. Oh, you can, you can violate the rules and stand out and be a unique person, but at the very minimum, you're not going to get pay raises. You're not going to get promotions. Uh, people are not going to evaluate you well. Other employees might, might start to isolate you as well as your bosses. And in the final analysis, you may get fired. And I'll tell you right now, in an environment such as this, when the real unemployment rate is about 15%, your chances of getting another high-paying job are about zero. Okay? You can go work at Wendy's or Target or something like that, and I'm sure that that's nice for you know, some upper-level managers, but those are not jobs you can even live on. Okay? Be better off moving to Indonesia and working for a Nike factory, frankly. We should have a place to stay. In this country, you make $7 an hour, you're going to be living in your car if you even have a car. Okay? Or in a sewer, or in an uh, abandoned subway tunnel, or at your mom's, in your mom's basement. And she doesn't want you there. <clears throat> okay? Because you still don't take out the trash. Anyway, <clears throat> and I do want to say, we talked about gender in this class. I, as a child, I was very upset at the fact that my sisters were never told to take out the trash or mow the lawn. That bothers the hell out of me. What kind of a nonsense is that? Some kind of gender divide that women can't mow the grass. Who made that rule up? The same people said they couldn't fight in combat? Okay. Anyway. You wait, ladies. Eventually, you're going to have to sign up for selective service. If you're a man and you don't sign up for selective service, what does the government do? They throw you in jail. They say they fine you and stuff, but they can, they can throw you in jail. Okay. Anyway. And that's not even the draft. Anyway. One of the issues here with corporate culture is certainly the fact is who, who tends to dominate corporations at the upper, up, at the upper level? Who tends to dominate corporations at the upper levels? The owners. I, I mean demographically. What race? What, what gender? Old white men. Mostly. Right? Not old. I mean, how old is Mark Zuckerberg? He's younger than me. He's like, what, 32? Sergey Brin, Google, right? He's what, 30, he's my age. Okay. You are right for the most part, that's traditionally what we look at. Does that impact the culture of a corporation? Is it, let me put it another way. Is, a corp, is, a, is sometimes a corporation a hostile place for women and, and minorities to work? Even for white men it can be hostile, can it? What happens, why would it be hostile for white men? You think all white men think alike and have had the same life experiences? Okay? Like me and Mitt Romney. I got more in common with somebody who lives in the projects than with Mitt Romney. No matter what race they are. Okay? Mitt Romney grew up with 20 million platinum spoons in his mouth. He's never ever in his life went to bed hungry. He never ever had to worry about where he was going to stay or what kind of car he had or if people cared about him. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. The problem with being wealthy is you never really know who your true friends are. I'll tell you that right now. That is one down pitfall of being wealthy. Especially when you get wealthy all of a sudden, and all of a sudden you have family members you never even heard of come crawling up and let me borrow 50 bucks or 50,000 or something like that. So, but anyway, so maybe the lower level employees who are from a different class, they don't have any respect for these IBM people. So it, it is very much a conflictual a uh, top-down relationship for a lot of people, but there are other ways to look at corporate culture, and here is an example of it. And we'll get back to the hostility aspect of this. Take, think of what we just described with IBM, and then take a look at this. This is a short video from YouTube on Google's culture, on their corporate culture, and how they behave. And think about how this is differently, and we'll quickly, we'll quickly analyze this, and then we'll watch another one on Enron, which Enron was a company that was at one point had a market cap of about seventy billion dollars, and in about two months went to absolutely zero. Their stock was at about ninety dollars and went to zero. Um, twenty, I think it was about twenty-five thousand to thirty thousand people at Enron lost their jobs. Uh, their pensions were completely destroyed. 
Uh, Arthur Anderson, their, their accounting firm, law was, was put out of, the government demanded because they committed all these crimes that they be put in bankruptcy. They didn't even do that to AIG, which essentially stole $185 billion of your money and has no intention of ever giving it back. I'll tell you that right now. Um, <clears throat> and they're still existing, and the executives still make 20, 30, I love this. We own AIG, but the executives still make $20 million, 20, 30 million dollars a year. That's just outrageous to most Americans. That's just unacceptable behavior. You know, and, and, and by bailing out AIG, it, it appears that we made the housing market worse. We didn't allow the things to be flushed out. And now the prices are still artificially too high in some regions, and still nobody's going to buy any houses, and nobody wants to insure any of these things. Okay, but again, with Arthur Anderson, they felt that their crimes were so heinous that they put them out of business. That was another 20,000 people. And many of those people had nothing to do with Enron. Okay, so we'll look at the Enron culture and see the, what happens inside of a country that, or a company that's somewhat fraudulent. And also you have to keep in mind, these are capitalist organizations. They absorb and internalize capitalism, the idea of competition, the concept of uh, focusing on profit, the idea that you've got to be cutthroat to some extent, uh, even, even against people in your own company. You want competition at all levels in the company, but once you get, like Enron did, to the point where traders are stepping on other people and stabbing people in the back to get what they want, many people, at least observers, outside observers, excuse me, would say that the corporate culture has gone too far in absorbing capitalist values. All right, here we go. Google is kind of a unique company for me and for, I think for a lot of people that work there. What Google does is it allows you a fantastic environment to Check do out the, what they're dressed like. Do that really quickly. There's a very different structure than the rest of the engineering community. We always really try to avoid bureaucracy so that people can really do what makes sense in their project. One thing that's great about Google is that you have a lot of autonomy of your product and its directions. We're encouraged to work on whatever we think is important. Often the best ideas come from employees. At Google, if you come in in your first week and you have a good idea on how things should be done, and people agree with you, in that first week you can start. You think Exxon Mobil is going to listen to some rookie that just got hired? It's very young and very vibrant. This amazing combination of a corporate campus and a university playground. There's a lap pool. There are pool tables. There are mini kitchens throughout the campus so that you can get a this bite business. whenever you want to. There's a dry cleaning facility. There's a laundry Sign facility. Me up. You can bring your dogs to work. They have 30,000 people. Yoga, yeah. Yeah. Pilates. I love massages. I'm a spa queen. Let me mention the food. Food here, by the way, is great. I like to sleep in. They have their own cafe. So I'll come in around 11 or so. And you know, that's just fine. I get my work done and everyone's very good. Come in at 11 o'clock in the morning. Cafe. Slice I like a lot because they do like organic foods and it's a nice place to hang out. Um, I'm actually meeting with my designer here today and we're talking over some of the designs that we're working on. And we like this place because it's um, very casual and it's kind of a laid back atmosphere for us. It's really a great place to work. And there's a lot more videos on that, but you see there, um, they're, chal they're challenging a lot of assumptions. First of all, uh, they're challenging this assumption that if you're new to the company, you don't know enough and you just need to be quiet. And if you have a good idea, just keep it to yourself. Uh, that is, I'll tell you right now, you go ask IBM, they'll tell you it's a stifling environment. I mean, if they're so innovative, then why is their company basically just every day losing ground? Okay? Um, and a lot of tech companies are sort of out there and they try new things. It's sort of within the vein of what technology is. Technology itself is the application of new ideas, specific problems using machinery or engineering. Um, so part of this fits very well with the culture there. Um, also, they're challenging uh, 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 tradition in the sense that is there any scientific evidence that shows that people are better, happier, more productive workers when they get up at 6 o'clock in the morning? Just in general, and we don't, I don't have any scientific data, uh, although if anybody using their laptop wants to look this up, uh, look up whether or not people who get up in the morning are happier people. Um, uh, just from what you think of, what percentage of the American people would prefer to get up and go to work at 10 o'clock in the morning? Probably every single one of them, including Donald Trump. Right? 
And here's the problem. If I can scientifically prove that it, it is more productive and people are more efficient and they call off of work less, I would say one of the number one reasons why people call off work is that anybody ever heard you wake up in the morning and you just feel nauseous? You know, or dizzy, or just you don't feel right, you feel sore, and then a couple hours later you feel a lot better, right? Or if you call off work, you think you're sick, and then you sleep for another two hours, and you're what you really need to sleep, okay? And one of the interesting things is scientists have shown, actually, that as the human brain goes into later teenage years, that the body needs more sleep, and it self-regulates itself later, but when, but what I love about it, and elementary school start at 9.30, high school start at 7.40. Now, some of them are trying to reverse this process. They're trying to let high schools go later, uh, which is a good idea. But again, I don't, IBM is not going to change the idea that at 8, 8 o'clock in the morning um, that you need to be there. Uh, I, I, to give you another example of how culture impacts the way we view culture, uh, corporate behavior, in South America, particularly in Mexico, um, because it's very hot in some of these countries, they take a siesta in the middle of the day that sometimes is from 11 to 2 in the entire day. Guess why they stopped doing that? Guess who kept calling at 11 o'clock in the morning wondering why nobody was picking up the phone? Guess who? Huh? Well, who does IBM represent? Right, the, Amer the Americans were calling up and going, what the hell is your problem? This is totally unprofessional. I'm going to take my work somewhere else. They're like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. So a lot of companies don't bother doing this anymore. But why is it a good idea? First of all, you save energy because it's hotter than hell outside in a lot of Have you ever been to Mexico in the middle of the day in the summer? I mean, my God, it makes me long for Phoenix. And there's not many trees out in the Sonoran Desert, okay? I mean, literally, in the desert, you can die within a few hours. Okay, seriously. Um, and on top of that... It probably makes the workers happy. They can go home, get something to eat, get a little rest, spend some time with their family, maybe even pick their kids up from school and take them home, and have one of the relatives watch after them. Okay? And in some levels, because it's part of tradition, it fits with the national culture as well. But the United States comes in and says, don't do that. And do you really think that South American and Latin American countries want to listen to what the United States has to say about their culture? They're very upset. Most, most people were very upset about this. But this was in... An unjust imposition under their culture. But again, what the United States say, hey, you can take a siesta, it's going to take our business to China or Europe. Okay? And, 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 and those of you who wonder who, what national culture created the idea of an alarm clock, you can thank the British for that one. Part of the reason why is that in England in the winter, the sun doesn't come up until like 10 o'clock in, in the morning, and it goes down at like 3 or 4 in the afternoon. And they, the, factory work, the factory owners figured out that people only got up when the sun came up and that during the winter they were losing four to five hours a day of work because everybody traditionally went home. So they said, all right, from now on, you're going to be here at eight. And they were like, eight in the morning? What? There's no such thing as eight in the morning. Hmm. The sun's not up. And they were like, hey, hey, you either show up at eight or you're fired. And they said, well, how are we supposed to know? The rooster doesn't even crow until then. It's probably dead because it's the winter anyway. Okay, probably froze to death. They're like, don't worry. We'll go over to the church or to the city hall and ring this really loud bell for 20 minutes. So make sure to get all of you up. And so they made a little version of that. And if you see old, old alarm clocks, what do they have on top of them? Bells. That is one of the most annoying noises in the world to me. I'd rather hear 50 people scrape their fingernails down a chalkboard than listen to another stupid alarm clock. And when I retire, I'm going to go out in the middle of the public square and I'm going to take every alarm clock I can and I'm going to pour gasoline on them and I'll burn them and I'll dance around like a lunatic. Because this is going to be over. I'm never going to get up before 10 o'clock in the morning again unless I'm going to Disneyland or something like that. I'll get excited about that. Okay. Well, Disney World, Disneyland sucks. <laughs> Disneyland is in one of the worst neighborhoods in Anaheim I've ever... I mean, we walked two blocks to Disneyland and got accosted by two homeless people and a hooker. So there you go. It's the happiest place on earth, all right. For Elliot Spitzer. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Elliot, don't spend $5,000 on sex, dude, unless you want me people to make fun of you. <laughs> I mean, just a lack of financial sense alone is really stupid. All right, here is an example of the culture at Enron. Check this out now. 
Enron, no one was more aggressive than the traitors. If I'm on the way to my boss's office to argue about my compensation, and if I step on somebody's throat on the way, that doubles it, well, I'll stomp on the guy's throat. <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that's that how sounds crazy. Want. I'm trading side. That's not a normal laugh. That's like <laughs> bad. <laughs> See that devil on my shoulder telling me what to do? Necessity, if you want to be in the market, you had to deal with Enron. Enron was a bully. Probably a bully. Enron's traders were like the super powerful high school clique that even the principal doesn't dare to rein in. They had become the major engine of at least reported profits at the company. They took Jeff Skilling and Ken Lay's belief in free markets and turned it into an ideology. What they pitch it almost as a new economic religion. The forces will no longer fight for the monopoly. Enron Online will change the markets for many, many commodities. It is creating an open, transparent marketplace that replaces the dark, blind system that existed. It is real simple. You turn on your computer, and it's right there. That's our vision. Uh, we're trying to change the world. Yeah, they did all right. We're destroying people's trust in corporate. Well, there wasn't much trust. I think Jeff Skilling had a desperate need to believe that Enron was a success. I think he identified with Enron. He proclaimed at one point, I am Enron. Now, let me show you if I can find a good scene here. Here, here's a good one. Here, here's to tell you, Jeff Skilling was the CEO. This is the type of mentality. This is the type of mentality that he cultivated. And these are these are in-run traders talking about how they robbed people. Like, Kevin McGowan, Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, that they did fine. Yeah, Bob. Yeah. Thanks. They're talking about how they robbed old ladies in California. Listen. It'll keep going. Robert. Sorry about the, the language there, but I, I, I showed you this piece to illustrate the point. Think, I mean, listen to those people. Is that the type of people you want to work around? Is that the type of environment you want to work in? And Jeff Skilling set the tone. He said, look, go for it. The only thing I care about is profits. I don't give a damn about ethics. And what they're talking about there is that Enron was, Enron had control of the California power grid along with a few other companies, and they were deregulated meaning that the price would be set by the market. And in order to make the price of electricity shoot up, it eventually went up to $1,000 a megawatt, which normally is about 4 or $5. They turned off power plants on purpose, trying to say they were cleaning them or fixing them. And again, it's like Nintendo actually did this with video games. They, Super Mario Bros. 2, they released like four of them and jacked the price up to $70 because uh, you create an artificial shortage. And Enron denied for years that they were manipulating the energy markets, and you hear you have these traders who thought they were 
be listened to, su suggesting that we don't give a damn, uh, and the only thing we care about is making money, and not only that, listen to the filth in their language, listen to the attitude they had towards older people, towards Americans, towards American values. These are not people you'd want to spend time with, and, and the unfortunate thing is that a lot of these people you just heard never got arrested or charged with anything. Let me show you a little, if I'll find one more real quick one. Nothing's ever quick on YouTube. I'm going to show you one about Jeff Skilling, and then we were going to move on to talk about a fictional company named Dunder Mifflin. We're going to show you a couple office episodes to look at how smaller offices are impacted by the behavior of their managers. Oh, by the way, the company I just showed you, the, the corporate culture to Google, they own this site. So uh, I would say to them, Maybe you should spend less time on your skateboard and your unicycle and make sure that this thing doesn't freeze up in five minutes. You ever heard of that, Google? Yeah, you ain't that damn good. Okay? Don't be too proud of yourself. Pride is usually the sign of, some, uh, like, an, an, an intense overarching pride is usually the sign of a mental disturbance or a mental imbalance or emotional immaturity. People are overly prideful or promote themselves over other people, usually suffering from narcissistic personality disorder, and I would say that to Google. Sergey, I'm waiting for your stupid site to load. You need to get with it. I don't care how many billions of dollars you got. It's like the, it's like the, the people who run McDonald's. You got billions of dollars, but you sell garbage to kids. Okay? I mean, you're about as bad as the tobacco industry. More people die from eating bad food than smoking cigarettes. Okay? Although 440,000 people die every year smoking cigarettes. Anyway. Let me try to find it. I think this is a good, I think this one will display what we're doing. And then we'll move on to the office. We'll talk about how this works from a micro setting and look at the hostile workplace. So. Now we'll, on next Monday, we'll talk more about the book uh, and, we'll, and we'll deal again with what's going on in Amarco a little bit more. And also I'll most likely have your first take home test for you to look at as well. Uh, it won't be due, it will most likely be due two weeks after I hand it to you. I may even have it done this weekend and send it out to you by email, so pay attention to you. Here we go. Here's Skilly. Listen to this guy's background. I'm my son, Jeff Skilly, the guy who had the answer to what the future of the the whole business was supposed to be. Kenley is also a guy who considers himself a visionary, and he liked other people he thought of as visionaries. He liked people with big ideas, and Jeff Skilling was a person with the biggest ideas of all. Jeff Skilling's biggest big single idea, idea was to find a new way to deliver energy. Rather than be bound by the physical flow of the pipeline, Enron would become this a kind a of stock market yeah. for natural gas. It, it was a magical draw. new idea. Transform energy into financial instruments that could be traded like stocks and bonds. So that was the one good idea. In 1992, using that good idea, we became the largest buyer and seller of natural gas in North America. He really believed that the idea was everything, and that when you came up with an idea, you should be able to book the profits from that idea right away. Because otherwise, some lesser man was taking the profits from the idea that some greater man had come up with in the past. When Jeff Skilling applied to Harvard Business School, the professor asked him if he was smart. He replied, I'm fucking smart. So you know, you One know of his favorite books business. was The Selfish he got Gene, in. about the ways human nature is steered by greed and, and competition in the service of passing on our genes. Does it escape you that you, At Enron, you still wanted to, to set free the basic the instincts world? of survival of the fittest. Jeff had a very Darwinian view of how the world worked. He was famous for saying once in Enron's early years that money was the only thing that motivated people. Skilling's notion of how the world should work really trickled down and affected everything about how Enron did business. He instituted a system known as the PRC, or Performance Review Committee. It required that people be graded from a 1 to a 5, and roughly 10% of people had to be a 5, and those people were supposed to be fired. Hence, this came to be known as ranking. 20% of your workforce fired every year, man. But the 
PRC process is the most important the process that. that we conduct as a company. I've never heard of a company yet that would be successful terminating 15% of their people every year uh, just to satisfy the fact that the other employees had to vote on them. And so when you're being evaluated by that group, you are getting direct communication from... Think about how paranoid about the employees the probably were. Company are and how you Lobbying each other. Hey, don't give me a lie. Come on. Process. Right. They built for a 25-year-old right. to go in and to be reviewed and to be superior. As a consequence, get a $5 million bonus. I don't think that's repeated in many places in corporate America. Our culture is, 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 a, culture is, is a very, uh, very aggressive culture. At Enron, no one was more aggressive than the trader. Oops, I think he froze. Get on it, Sir James. If I'm on the way to my boss's office to argue about my compensation, and if I step on somebody's throat on the way, that doubles it. So we just saw this stomp on the guy's throat. But that's <laughs> you know that. So that was. <laughs> that's how people were. So again, and what they're suggesting here is that there was a trickle down effect, and by Jeff Skilling, remember that hidden culture that Rosabeth Cantor talked about in the Intersections book, where she said that what happens many times in a company is that. People who are at the top tend to hire people who have similar backgrounds. This explains the white male thing. Also explains how all these Ivy League people get into these Fortune 500 schools. And, and also how a lot of these people have, or Fortune 500 companies, uh, how these companies have similar mindsets where nobody stood up at Enron and said, hey, this is wrong. You guys are turning the power off in California on purpose to drive the price up artificially? That's unethical at the very minimum, if not illegal. You're, you're faking profits? And you're lying to the market, you know, you're, you're borrowing money and yet not putting on the books as debt. So one of the things that Rosabeth uh, Cantor said in her study was that there's a hidden culture that even the, the people inside the company don't fully recognize, or maybe they're in denial of, that suggests that, um, uh, and, and this is actually a term for that, they probably need to find a different term. Uh, uh, it's either home homopathy or homophilic behavior, meaning that you are attracted to those that are like you. Well, you know we have this idea in romance, opposites attract. Let me tell you something about opposites attract. Do you really think that that's a good way to start a marriage and to keep a marriage together, especially in the age of divorce and promiscuity and cohabitation? Do you really think not having anything in common with your spouse or your mate is a good way to go forward? And same with business, right? You can't. Now, sometimes you want to have people with different views because they provide a different perspective. Like in presidential administrations, many times you'll have two people who are completely different in their perspective, but the president still decides. But he's able to listen to both sides, and there's a benefit to that. But inside of a company, most of the executives have this idea that I don't want anybody who's not like me because I don't want you tattling or whistleblowing or, or getting mad and getting walking off and getting fired or just being unproductive or whatever it is. So skilling by his behavior of saying, hey, 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 I'm doing this. You should do it too. And again, it becomes like in, in like a street gang. You want to please the, the street gang leader, so if somebody robs a bank for 20000 you go rob a bank for 100000 Someone shoots one of your gang members, the, uh, the rival gang member, you shoot 20 of them. Bring back your arms and legs too. Chop them off, okay? This is how you get ahead. And the business world is just as vicious on a lot of levels, okay? I mean, look, we've gotten to the point in this, in this world where I, 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 some people take competition to the level. There was a case, I think it was a school, small school in Colorado, and it wasn't even a Division I-A school. And if those, those of you know something about football, or is the punter a prize position? No, it's actually, you get made fun of when you're the punter. No, no, no cheerleaders hang out with you when you're the punter. Uh, none of the other players want anything to do with you. If you open your mouth during a team meeting, they shout you down. The only thing they want you to do is not mess up, unless you're Weatherford, then you're a stud, right? Anyway, um, but it, at the school in Colorado, one guy got beat out for the punter position, so he went and got a knife and stabbed the other guy. Some other guy owned a pizza place, and some other pizza place opened across the street from him. He went and bought mice at the store and went to the bathroom to put them in the ceilings. Enron was that way. It didn't matter how you made money. You heard him screwing Grandma Millie, right? Screw her. 
You heard the language. Every other word was F this, F that. Is that the way you want a corporate culture to break down? And I'll tell you what. Do you think Enron's manual said, okay, every two words I want you to say the F word. Make sure you curse liberally. And make sure it's recorded on tape. And I find it, this is like Richard Nixon. And Nixon's mouth was worse than <laughs> Nixon. Nixon make a sailor blush. I'm telling you, seriously. Um, it got so bad that in the transcripts that he released, they had to write expletive deleted constantly. <laughs> and he said horrible things about black people, about Jewish people, all kinds of stuff. Well, horrendous stuff. You know, and it had to be released. But he was actually <clears throat> probably similar to these traitors. Nixon was recording himself because he wanted to catch people making promises and then call them on them later. Like, say, no, November 17th at 2.45 p.m., you said the following. And I got it on tape. But it, he didn't understand that he had trapped himself in his own spider web. <laughs> and eventually, you know, it led to him resigning. But again, so you see here these elements of corporate culture. Now, again, we have this theory that corporate culture trickles down, but also that it, it, it trickles up. That individuals at the bottom level, whether they're mid-level managers or whether they're regular employees, to make it through the day and make work bearable, they make adjustments to these policies. We call these secondary adjustments or informal corporate culture. So, and to show you this, both this trickle-down aspect and some of the impacts, and some of the impacts of, of uh, the manager's position and perspective on corporate culture, I'm going to show you two office episodes. So, those in the video. And one of them is called, they're both in season two. Probably get a call from NBC now. Um, I'll be like, I bought this, though, NBC. So, anyway. Um, and the first one is called Sexual Harassment, and it deals with hostility in the workplace. And what I want you to pay attention to this one is um, how Michael's behavior encourages other people in the office to behave in a, 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 a in maybe what is an inappropriate manner. The role that Toby and Jan, who are part of corporate, corporate, the corporate right office, how how he how Michael reacts to them, and also what they're trying to do and trying to lay down these rules and the ideas of crossing the line, and also how the other employees feel about how Michael behaved. Then the next one is we're going to watch is called conflict resolution, where. It, the people have issues with each other in the workplace, just like people do, like a family would, or like a small organization, or anything like that. And instead of, he thinks Toby, who he can't stand, if you've seen The Office, uh, he, he says outrageous things to Toby. It's like, why are you so evil? And, and, all, and all kinds of stuff. He's like, you are so evil, I don't even know where to start. I mean, that kind of, and what, he really, what Michael is expressing is he can't, he thinks, that he feels Toby's a spy. And he's not part of his family. You also hear Michael in the, both episodes repeatedly call the office a family. So it's interesting this, this sort of uh, um, convergence with the ideas that Hochschild was talking about and, and, and the problems that this causes. And one of the things that he does is the, all the people in the office are having issues with one another. And so instead of dealing with it one-on-one -on -one in private or on, in private like Toby was doing, he comes out in the office and says, okay, who has problems with so-and-so? And this is a report that says this. And see, how he thinks it's going to make the office more open and more friendly and better, and we'll see what exactly happens. So again, let's start with the first one. Let me turn the camera on. Down. So if now, instead of, instead of only 80 million workers, there's 140 million workers, what's going to happen to wages naturally? This is why a lot of people are critical of illegal immigration. That what it does is creates a much larger pool of lower waged uh, people who are willing to do really just many times terrible jobs like picking fruit off of trees that have been sprayed with poisonous pesticides and things like that. The cancer rate among farm workers is off the charts. You wouldn't believe it. Um, if you've ever seen these, anybody ever seen pictures or video documentaries of these migrant workers in California that pick strawberries and all this stuff? This is not good work. Okay. And the reason why you can't pay people a lot of money is how much are strawberries? How much is an apple? You know, you'd really have, you'd have to have somebody pick a thousand apples an hour to give them a decent wage. What's interesting? Anybody here read *Grapes of Wrath*? Nobody's read *Grapes of Wrath* from John Steinbeck. Man, what is going on? What is going on in high schools around here? Seriously, at least watch the movie with uh, uh, um, Henry Fonda. That's Jane Fonda's dad. Um, the plot of the movie was 
that these uh, families from Oklahoma were being eaten up by the Dust Bowl and the Depression, so they went out to California and they couldn't make a living because they flooded the, the food growing regions and the owners of the plantations go, well, I'll pay you one cent an hour. You know, I'll pay you half a cent. 